and welcome to Man Enough. I'm Justin Baldoni. I'm Liz Plank. And I'm Jamie Heath. And every week we have deep, uncomfortable conversations about what it means to be a man in the world today. Uh, something that Liz is an expert on. She obviously. is. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> and, 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 and she has said something blew my mind. One of the things that she said was, I asked her, what makes you an expert on being and talking about man enough? I said, what makes me an expert to talk about masculinity is what makes you an expert to talk about whiteness. I mean, that, that mm. I'm going to keep. Mm, 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 so mm. because of that, so glad that we do this together. Uh, who do we got coming on today? Ah, well, speaking of uncomfortable conversations. Mm. We have Emmanuel Acho, who started Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. And um, that show was really important mm. to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. and, and, and God bless him for, for being willing to have this conversation. Because uh, not everybody in our country, um, well, I would say a lot of white folks in our country, um, don't have a black person that they are close with. And he kind of he kind of was willing to become everybody's black friend, which is, I, I don't know how he did that, um, knowing what you've had to put up with, just with me. Uh, what are you looking at me like that for? I'm agreeing, I'm saying I, I feel you on that. <laughs> Not just you, but other people and family and yeah. uh, mm -hmm. my whole life, yeah. It's a, um, it's a blessing. It's a and bounty, I think. It's a bounty a, and also a um, can be a burden. It is. And uh, what I think in many ways what his show and what he is doing to help educate white folks is kind of what we're doing yeah. with men. Yeah. A little bit here. He has so. uncomfortable conversations about race and we have uncomfortable conversations about gender. Yes, we know? do. So. Yes, we do. So, so, uh, so let's get into it. Let's get into it and see what we get. All right. We will be right back. This is Man Enough. Hey there, Justin here. I just want to jump in real quick and talk to you about therapy. I believe that there's nothing more important that we can do on an individual level for the health and safety of our relationships and friendships than work on ourselves and go to therapy. Therapy is like stretching in the gym. And that's why I want to talk to you about BetterHelp. BetterHelp is one of our sponsors. If you haven't been to therapy yet or experience the freeing feeling of what it's like to talk to somebody who is objective, who will not take sides, and who is licensed and trained in this area, please, please, please consider trying therapy via BetterHelp. That's betterhelp.com slash man enough. You get 10% off if you're a man enough listener. And whether you are struggling with depression, if you have some extra stress at work, if you have anxiety and you don't even know what to do with it, if you are having a hard time getting out of a relationship or you're having trouble in your relationship, Maybe you're having trouble sleeping or you have anger issues. Whatever it is that's going on, you can talk to somebody about it and they will listen. And one of the barriers to entry to therapy has always been money. A lot of people don't have insurance and therapy is expensive. But BetterHelp is making therapy much more affordable and accessible. And they even have financial aid available. So please check out BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash man enough. You get 10% off for your first month, and you can join over 1 million people who've taken charge of their mental health. Going to therapy doesn't mean you're broken. It means you're human. Hello, and welcome back to the Man Enough podcast. We have a, a larger-than-life, very special guest today. Uh, my man, Emmanuel Acho. My guy. First and foremost, it's an honor. It's a pleasure, truly. I'm humbled, gentlemen, ladies, <laughs> Justin. <laughs> uh, and and it's, it's great because we've only had a little bit of a, a social media relationship. And uh, Liz, mm -hmm. would you mind telling us a little bit about Emmanuel? Yes, Emmanuel, you were born and raised in Dallas, Texas to Nigerian immigrant parents. Mm. And you're the youngest of four. In the summer of 2020, after the death of George Floyd, you created a recently Emmy-nominated YouTube series called mm. Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. Uh, you followed that effort with a book with the same name. Uh, it's become a number one New York Times bestseller. Uh, wow. And your next book, I don't know when you got time to do that, uh, but you are writing a, a next book that's going to be out in January 2022 that's called Illogical, Saying Yes to a Life Without Limits. It's such a pleasure to have you here with us, Emmanuel. Thank you. Liz, thank you. I'm glad that was a short bio. There's nothing <laughs> worse than like a long bio. I spent so much time tightening my bio. Mm. Be, I 
I'm just like, let's just get right to the meat and potatoes of conversation. But isn't it a beautiful That's thing that into. you have, you've accomplished that much? It's cool. You know, I've, I've done a lot in a year, I guess you could say. <laughs> um, but I say this, you haven't accomplished anything until you can no longer list off your accomplishments. Mm, there you go. Me. There we go. Now we're like, Which is why generally, I mean, it's cool what you've done. You've done some cool things, right? Um, I don't care about all that. Yeah. Mm. I don't care. Yeah, uh, um, what I care about more about about who you are, but why you are yes. who you are. So, so that's why. So we're let's get, get into, into it. it. Yes. All right. First question. We always start with this. Am I man enough? No, that's the last question. Okay. <laughs> uh, when was the last time you didn't feel enough? <laughs> um, that's funny, man. That's a good question. So you're talking to one of the most confident individuals on the planet i me and confidence have a great relationship but i flirt with cockiness right i mm. you know i sometimes i cheat on confidence with arrogance but here's what i've realized is confidence is believing an ability you actually have arrogance is believing in an ability you may not have and so i had mm. to learn that recently the last time i felt like i wasn't enough i was hosting the bachelor after the final rose Mm -hmm. And mind you, I am well equipped typically to do all the jobs I'm asked to do. But on like two weeks notice, maybe a week's notice, they asked me to host The Bachelor after the final rose. For those of y'all that don't watch the show, first time in the history of the show, first black bachelor, dude named Matt James. He has chosen this white woman, Rachel Kirkconnell, but problem, people. Um, Rachel Kirkconnell has racially insensitive photos surface of her at an antebellum plantation. Not good. So in comes Emmanuel Acho. Now I have to host a bachelor after the final <laughs> rose. What am I to do? Mm. First problem, Justin, I don't watch the show. Second problem, Jamie, I don't watch the show. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I have to host this. Anyway, let me get to your point. Why did I feel like I wasn't enough? You have a figurative tool belt in conversations. I always have a tool belt and I have every weapon in that belt. So I'm hosting after the final rose and I'm sitting there and I ask Matt James because him and Rachel are no longer in a relationship. And I ask him this, Justin, I say, if Rachel does all the things you ask her to do, will you all get back together? And he's like, well, you know, Emmanuel, I just want to see her do the work. He dodges the question. Liz, I ask another time. If she does, in fact, do the work, will y'all end up together? He dodges the question again. Mm -hmm. At this point in time, I don't know what to do because mm. TV one on one. He bobbed the first question. Go to it again. Get an answer. He bobbed it again. Now I have producers in my ear, higher ups. Ask him again. Ask him again. I can't ask him again. Mm. I'm sitting there on the chair. It's just me and him. Like, y'all don't know what I'm feeling. He just bobbed it again. Mm. I left it alone. That was the that was the most recent time I felt not enough because I felt inadequate. Mm. Like I always have the answers. I always have the questions, but I didn't know what the heck to do. Mm. Like I rarely ever feel like I'm not enough, but that, oh, it still burns me to this day mm. because I wow. couldn't do the job. Mm. We couldn't be more different people. <laughs> <laughs> it's, mm. I, I want to live in your body for a second for a few reasons. Uh, so, but I, I want to like I can't even imagine what it would feel like to wake up and just always feel like I was enough. So that means you, you mean to tell me? Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, you have have you ever felt not enough um, as a brother, as a son, as a friend, as a man, as a person of color? Yeah, but now see, you, if I were to go back to my NFL days, way different story, right? Y'all are asked talking to Emmanuel Acho. Last 13 months me is a different me, right? Last mm -hmm. 13 months me is on a whole nother level of confidence, of ability. But when I was in the NFL, I was drafted to the Cleveland Browns in 2012. Where is Cleveland, by the way? I had no idea where it was on a map until I got drafted. I was like, wait, okay, they say Midwest, but I'm in the mid. How can you be in the mid and the West? That's a contradiction. <laughs> right. um, and so I get drafted to Cleveland and I get cut five times before I am 25. Again, for those listening, not super familiar with football, I got fired from my job five times prior to the age of 25. And meanwhile, my brother, one year older than me, gets drafted in the fourth round the year before me, sets like the Cardinals rookie sack record. He was drafted to the Arizona Cardinals. So I'm sitting here just feeling totally inadequate, if you will, in the game of football. Just because yeah. like, dang, my brother's out here killing it. I'm out here just trying to survive. 
So in sports, I often felt not enough, mm. um, particularly when I got to the NFL. What it sounds like is all of your not a, like the times you felt not enough are related to accomplishments or that's what I'm here or professions. But I think what we're trying to get to is what's underneath that. Like those things are all good and dandy. Like your last 13, 14 months, not only did you write a book, you got the middle grade book come out that hit number one, you got your next book coming mm. out, you got two shows. I know all the stuff that you've been doing, but if you stripped all that away, what's underneath that? Well, see, your boy was, um, I grew up in the church, 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 black church, Dallas, Texas. So underneath all that, you just find a man grounded in faith. Mm. So I will rarely, my dad's a pastor. I'll rarely ever really feel not enough in that sense, primarily because I know I'm complete in God. There right, you go. like so now I get to yep. a spiritual place, right? But I don't often like, like speaking. I don't like speaking Christianese. You feel me? Like I don't like speaking because let me speak in a language that everybody can understand. I like just speaking in layman's terms. Yeah. So I don't to be not enough to me would be the then be like you're you're short. Like how are you not enough? Right? In whose eyes are you not enough? Yeah. In my eyes, I can't not be enough. When it just comes to if I strip down to a fundamental soul level of who I am, yeah, mm -hmm. because what could be more? Well, exactly. You know, and like there, to me, there just there can't be there. Could, there's a song, and it very simply says, "There can never be a more beautiful you." Mm -hmm. Yeah, hundred percent like, agree. I just right. don't. There couldn't. But be at the, more. right, but at the same time, I mean, a lot of your work is helping white people figure out how they've fallen short, right, and how we're not doing enough. And so as a man, mm -hmm. how are you uh, potentially not doing enough or being enough with the women in your life? Like, how does that work translate to your work as a man and masculinity? Or, or has that not necessarily crossed your mind? Well, so I'm single and I am single by choice of the aspect of like, OK, I don't want to let people down. Right. So the only aspect in which has crossed my mind is like, OK. If you say you get into a committed relationship, but like, what if, what if you're not enough to make another person happy? But like, what if you're not enough to maintain your own happiness? Cause I'm not a dude that like wants to get married and have it end. And so the fear of not being enough just keeps me maybe from taking another step, another leap, another bound, if you will, as far as like, manhood masculinity um relationally mm -hmm. but i'm so i just i i don't second guess me often. yeah I, let, well, you, let me, yeah let, you don't seem like somebody that so does. let me um uh, so forgive me so i'm just gonna challenge you a little bit. please all right so i hear all that and that's great what i feel is a little bit of armor on right mm -hmm. a lot uh, okay so I, what i'm hoping to do for a minute Pretend these cameras ain't here. Okay. <laughs> Pretend Justin Liz ain't here. And I say to you, hey man, I've screwed up a bunch in my life. Mm -hmm. Some things I could have done better. Uh, you have any experience with that? Anything that you've done, it's not about regret, because I understand some people live that way. But what are some ways you could have been better in a relationship or um, walking the walk as a man? Ooh, that's good. Now, now, before you answer, take your arm off, bro. That's good. I live by this, Jamie. I live by the reason most people fail is because they're willing to give up what they want most for what they want now. The reason most people fail because they're willing to give up what they want most. I live by that. And so I have sacrificed a lot of fun and pleasure and maybe potential joy for the sake of not failing. Mm. If y'all really want me to get transparent, the real transparency is I've sacrificed just being free for the sake of not failing. Cause I'm not even lying. I don't really have like a dang, I really, I wish I would have done that. There's not a ton, but it's only because I, I, every move I make, I calculate, I'm like a robot. I, I calculate everything. So I'm not really free. 
the decisions that I make, I've pre-planned 10,000 times over. So that's really okay. the only the, the part in life where I question me mm. is like, are you doing it right? It's I'm, I'm so curious what you're thinking right now, Liz, because <laughs> you said the word robot. And I said this story on another uh, another episode of our podcast, but I was promoting my book. I was doing this podcast, uh, someone else's podcast. I said, all right, let's list all the masculine and feminine qualities. Give me three masculine qualities. Tough. Yeah. Um, rugged. Rugged. Is that a quality? Or, or just, just, just masculine. I mean, strength. I can, strength. I mean, I can look at you and list 15 right now. I, I would say strength. I would say emotionless. Mm. And I would say toughness. That's great. And then give me a couple feminine qualities. Uh, I'm going to get judged. Sensitive. I would say like sweet. I would say caring, gentle, soft. So if I was developing like the state of the art robot that was going to just take over the world and accomplish all of our tasks, I would want it to have all of the masculine qualities. Mm -hmm. But if I wanted to make that robot a human, and bring it to life. I would give it all the feminine qualities. That's good. So the reason why I wanted to bring it over to Liz was because I'm just curious what, when you hear him talk about all these things, mm -hmm. like even the idea of you were a robot, what comes up for you as a woman listening to it? I mean, I'm frustrated because by virtue of living like in a, in a racist society, I as a white person have done things that are racist. Like that to me is like, how I enter into the amazing conversations that you've created. And what I'm sensing, and maybe I'm wrong, is that you're coming in saying, I haven't done anything. <laughs> like, like that you somehow are immune to what all other men, you know, have been programmed to, to be or do. And maybe you just haven't reflected on it. Positively or negatively? Or both? What, like I, immune. I think both. I, well, I think in a positive way that you're portraying yourself, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure you have no regrets with any interaction that you've ever had with a woman or the space that you've created has it, you know. I mean, it it's tricky though, right? Um, it's tricky. I actually like this conversation, mainly because I'm usually the one asking the questions <laughs> and y'all are making me think, but what's interesting is like, it's not even that I'm programmed a certain way, I'm just a certain way. So let me put it like this. <laughs> I've never drank a day in my life, right? Never drank alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I've never, you know, smoked, never done all that jazz. Mm -hmm. So I've just, I'm very, I discipline my body. I tell myself what to do. It doesn't tell me what to do. And so for that, that's just, that now has eliminated like 90% of errors that I just would have made. I'll put it like this, Liz. The mm -hmm. best, the, the most succinct way I can say this is I feel like you would regret, the figurative you, would regret a decision you didn't calculate the benefits or consequences of. But we're not in, you think you're, you're like rationally in control of everything you've ever done? Like, like if you really think about it. Do you really want me to answer No, but, but <laughs> yeah, what's you're, 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 hey, Emmanuel, what's all good? You're, I've listened to so many interviews. Your whole thing is like unconscious bias and unconscious racism, right? Like a lot of the things that we do are not conscious. And so you're uh, talking like uh, like uh, as if you uh, every single action that you've ever done is is this like you're aware and rationally in control of but there's so much that we're not okay so when you're talking about that aspect i do think there are a lot of things i've been ignorant of right like i'm kind of drawing a line there around intention because so many things for me in life are about intention and so I would agree in that there's probably a ton like unintentionally I've probably done some stuff that may not have even sur surfaced back to me um, and thus you know what I mean like unintentionally I'm sure I've done a lot but intentionally at least not a ton that I can think of okay all right hold that thought let's pay some bills we will be right back with man enough are you somebody who suffers from sleeplessness, anxiety, and pain? <laughs> 
I'm raising <laughs> both my hands and my legs all up in the air. Have you ever seen those uh, those commercials, those advertisements mm-hmm. where it's like the person like can't open the, yes. the cup, like, oh, and yes. then it spills all over them? That's what anxiety feels like. <laughs> well, we have a solution for you. Mm. CBD, mm. specifically Feels, which is a product that I've been using. Feels is a premium CBD that it'll just help you keep your head clear and feel your best. And CBD isn't about what you feel. It's more about what you don't feel. Stress, mm. anxiety, sleeplessness. People like you and I, I think Liz, mm-hmm. our brains are going a crazy at night. Fast. Yeah. And um, I've been taking CBD at night to help me have deeper sleep, actually. Mm. And I'm somebody who I've never put a drug in my body. That's true. Um, never been high. Yeah. Don't do anything like that. Never been drunk. And that's why I actually like CBD, because for me specifically, there's none of those symptoms. Mm. And it relaxes your body so that your mind can also relax, right? It goes exactly. both ways. Exactly. Kind of kicks in your parasympathetic nervous system. I love and, uh, it. And I've noticed deeper sleep even on my Aura Ring um, from using it. So if you are interested, they have monthly subscriptions. They do. And you can go to feels.com slash man enough mm-hmm. for 50% off your first order. That's a lot. That's, actually, that's actually a lot. Mm-hmm. That's F-E-A-L-S. I spelled it right. Dot com <laughs> slash man enough. And I hope you sleep well tonight, Liz Plank. Thank you. I will. I packed all my feels. And you're in your and, feels. And they're in my feels. Yeah. <laughs> and we're in your feels. This is man enough. It's interesting it, as a white person for me at the table, because so much of what I've learned about intention has come from black folks mm-hmm. and the difference between intention and impact, mm-hmm. especially this guy mm-hmm. right here. I've had some great intentions. <laughs> But I've had some bad impact. Mm-hmm. It's interesting for me to hear the conversation, especially from you. You're also everybody's black friend. <laughs> everybody's. Uh, everybody's black friend, which is also a burden, I'm sure. And it's got a, It's not easy. But your conversations helped me not have to, you know, ask one of my black friends <laughs> <laughs> things. Um, You're but welcome, luckily, Jamie. But, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Appreciate you. <laughs> more, so a few, more so a few of our other friends. But... But the intention impact conversation is interesting because I think what Liz was getting at is, and I'm going to just bring this back to me. So I've spent so much of my life with the armor on. Mm -hmm. And I think as men, we can so often try to rationalize our way through life. We can try to calculate Mm -hmm. our way through life. But so much of the most beautiful moments in our life are the uncalculable moments, the moments that you can't prepare for, the moments where there's learning. Because if we're calculating everything we're preparing for everything, then how are we able to actually to actually just be, you know, to have that learning hit us in the face? The question is, like, at what cost is it to just l- live in that manner? I don't know. I don't, I don't know what I want to know, but at what co- everything comes with a cost. What's the cost of not calculating? Hmm. Because not, not calculating, I think the prize is freedom. I think yeah, the I was gonna reward say, is free. Yeah, in some ways, I think it's the wrong question. I think the question is, what's the reward of not calculating? Mm. That is, but don't you have to, like, so here's the thing. I I, I was talking to uh, Kamaru Usman. Kamaru Usman is pound for pound like the baddest man in the world. UFC, I think he's a mm-hmm. welterweight yeah, champion. Yeah. Nigerian cat. Shout out to my Nigerian. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, and I asked him this question. I oh, it, it'll stick with me like for life. I asked him, when you get into the ring, what are you thinking about? And mind you, y'all, this is pound for pound the baddest person in the world. And he said to me, he said, I think about not losing because he's like, for me, the fear of failure is stronger than the thrill of victory. And I don't know. I, I live life like that. So while you look at the reward, I'm looking at the failure. The only difference that I'd push back on is that these are two men in a cage, which I believe is a metaphor for all of us right now as men and the patriarchy. You're literally referencing two men in a cage that have to fight to the death. And I believe that's what's happening to us men all over the world is we're in a cage. We are, we are in our fight or flight mode and it's causing us to make decisions from fear and not from love. And the root cause, especially you, because you spoke uh, Christianese, right? <laughs> I'll speak Baha'i for a second, understanding that 
we were created in the image of God out of love. So love has to motivate our actions. And the Baha'i Faith, Abdul Baha says, love never dwelleth in a heart possessed by fear. You can't have fear and love at the same time. Like one's, one's got to win. So if our decisions are calculated because we're, we're, uh, we're afraid of not being something, then that I believe is actually coming from a place of not enoughness. Let me say this. I love that you're here. I love that you're sharing what you're sharing because I, um, because having this conversation, um, we want to reach all people, mm -hmm. all men. Um, and we all don't think the same. Um, I mean, we, are we, we, we're okay to get real. Let's get it right. Honestly, I thought Wait, we were real 10 minutes ago. I, have we not been real this uh, whole no, time? No, no, no. Okay. You okay for me to go? Uh, uh, More real? Okay. So let me go say deeper. This. By the way, let me just say this. We had a whole list of questions to talk yeah, about that we haven't gotten to the first one. Okay, we'll get to them. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we probably we won't. won't. We, that'll we, make this a great yeah. conversation. Okay. Well, we can get to that. I'm enjoying this, by the way. <laughs> so <laughs> this is why I, uh, <laughs> this is why, uh, what I want to ask, share with you this. But when I was 25 years old, I started going to this uh, gathering called the Black Men's Gathering. Mm -hmm. um, why do we do this? It wasn't so that black men can get together and complain. It wasn't so we could talk bad about white people or the other. It was so that, um, you know, you've got a, um, imagine an orchestra and you've got strings and horns and you've got woodwinds and you've got percussion and you've got all these pieces. The point of the orchestra is all to sing together. But there are times that the strings need to get together by themselves mm -hmm. so that they can work out their own tuning mm -hmm. and the horns get together. It's not to outshine the strings. It's so that they can be together and work out their kinks so that when we do come together, we're united. So this was the purpose of the, of the gathering to work through some of the stuff so that we could be better for society. The only way to do that is to reflect. Mm -hmm. um, I live by a Baha'i quote that Baha'u'llah says, it says, uh, bring thyself to account each day ere thou art summoned to a reckoning. Bring thyself to account each day. Why would I do that? So that I can be better tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Reflect on my actions today, be better tomorrow. The only way I can do that is to be honest with myself. Jamie, give him the bullet point of your last 20 years. Bullet point. Um, 20 years, I have lots of money, super successful in the music industry, producer, get some awards, blah, 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 blah. Um, get married, I'm unfaithful. Had been molested when I was a kid, didn't deal with that. Um, get married, I'm unfaithful, um, multiple times. Destroyed a lot of hearts. Um, lost everything in my life and had to rebuild myself. Um, so how do I rebuild myself? I have to be accountable, responsible, look at my actions, reflect, try to be different the next day. I believe that all humans on the earth have to reflect. I think the reason why God has put us here so that we can learn, we can grow. The only way we do that is to reflect on stuff. And there's no way in life that a black man, is, as far as what I believe, has ex walked through this world and doesn't have something to reflect upon how they can be better. All people. But what, what we deal with since I was a kid and some of the feelings I've had, how I've walked, how then I've treated people, how... I was told I have to be to get ahead in the world, to be strong, to be this, to be tough, to never show weakness, to do all these things, um, to even be more articulate if you want to be accepted because you're black, to be um, all this, all this stuff, which I see in a lot of great people. But sometimes we got to take that off and be like, hey, bro, because you got kids. Mm -mm. OK, one day you're going to have a kid. And he's going to fuck up. And he's going to have to have a conversation with daddy that relates and says, oh, baby, I've been there. I've, I've learned how to be better. This is what I did. I looked at myself. I don't have to always be tough. I ain't got to be perfect. You're perfect in the sight of God, but we got to strive to be better. So if we don't do that, then we have this inequality in the world with men and women and with race and all that stuff, unless we are real. So what I see from you is this deep brother who's done a lot of great shit. You're super articulate. You're <laughs> handsome. You're strong. You, 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 you got a lot of success going on. I think you are contributing to humanity wonderfully. And I also see someone who's got his arm on still. Cause when I ask you a few questions straight up, you're ph philosophical, you're calculating. It's beautiful. I'm not saying that's bad, but I ain't heard a heart answer yet. And I know you got a heart in there. What do you, what do you mean by a, because here's, I was in this, oh man, I was having this conversation two days ago. 
you know when you watch those movies of people at, at, at war mm-hmm. and they're just so trained? Yeah. I think that's where I am now. Okay. Like I'm so where y'all are like, take your armor off. I'm like, you're going to have to ask me something that will make me because otherwise I'm not even, it's not even intentional. I'm just in such a place. Yeah. Have you ever read the night in rusty armor? Hmm. I have. It's one of my favorite books. I, uh, I, I first read it in therapy. Mm-hmm. I actually took my family, my entire family to a therapy retreat. And to summarize the book, it's about a knight that was known for his armor and he became it, it, at first was something to protect him and then he became known for it and he had a wife and kid and the wife said hey please take off your armor and he couldn't take his armor off his arm if he took his armor off he wouldn't be who he was to the world and eventually it got to the point where his wife left him left with the kids and he had to go to the mythical forest to refigure out who he was and it wasn't until he cried that his armor melted off. Hmm. He couldn't figure out how to take his own armor off because he was known for it. And I think as men, that's what we do. We we have to, we move through the world with this armor. And that's kind of what you're saying. It's like, mm-hmm. you're so trained, but to me it feels like it's your defense. Because I I I know I've taken it off before. Okay. And, and what happened when you took it off? It's not a safe place. There you go. There we go. Now, see, this is that's, <laughs> now that's the heart question. Not that's a, the hard answer. What's but, not safe about but it? But the thing is, why would I go somewhere not safe? <laughs> but isn't that what you're doing with white people? Like, it's not safe. Like, you want us to go to unsafe places, to uncomfortable. Like, that's your entire life's work. Like, don't you owe it to even black women and women of color to have examined that and reflected on your gender? Doesn't that help them too? Meaning, the kind of separate. When I say it's not a safe place, I'm talking about like for me personally. Right. Yeah. So okay. when I'm talking, when you're talking about co- uncomfortable conversations with a black man, I call it uncomfortable conversations with a black man just by nature of it's uncomfortable. But within the confinements of the conversation, there's actually a fairly safe space. Yeah. It's kind of like You've created everybody, a safe I've created space. a safe space. Everybody's safe there. Now, I'm going to say some things that might make you feel uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. I'm going to fake some things that are hopefully educational, but ain't nobody going to yell at you. You right. know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. you're, you're, you're going to be all right. You're going to be all right. At least, as long as you're here. I can't speak to when you go out those doors, but as long as you're here, <laughs> mm-hmm. it's safe. Um, well, that's what we're doing. This is a safe space. Welcome to Uncomfortable yes. Conversations <laughs> with <laughs> Men. Yes. Although I do it get was. that it's a safe spot, and yet there are, you know, hundreds of people listening or thousands. I don't know how many we got, but there are people listening. So I get that we're always conscious of that. Yes. Um, so we say it's safe. We're safe. But you, have, of course, have to. We're always guarded. The Internet is of, definitely not a yeah, safe place. Exactly. For me, it's like not. I know the thoughts that will make me cry. I know the thoughts that will break me. What I is, know the, name the one. thoughts. Which that, one? Um, I was in a field by myself in Philadelphia, and I was working out with street cones and an abandoned grass field with pigeons because I had just been released and I was by myself. If I stay there too long, it'll make me cry. I know I know where to, I know what door is not. Tell me why. Hold on. So you were released. Correct. You had these thoughts. That imagery was great. Or oh, I, I, I remember it. Okay. <laughs> I remember it vividly. Why did that feel long? What was it about that that made you make, it was, make you want to cry? Well, it that being there doesn't. But I start to, I feel sorry. I pity the old me. Hmm. Like I I pity that me. When I think about that person, I feel sorry for them. Why? Hmm. That person was alone. That person was dejected. That person didn't know what tomorrow held. Um, That person was broken. Like that person was going through it. That's not, you, you feel like you're describing me. (laughs) <laughs> but I don't feel sorry for me. I feel sorry for me because I think about how bad it was for that person. And I'm mm. sorry they had to go through that. Mm. Now that person just so happens to be me, but that's not me anymore. Okay. So I'm like, I, 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 I like I cry cause I weep for that person. Tell me, tell me another time that you wanted to cry. Any other time would be joy. Like I, I, I cry, okay. I cry 
I think maybe like last, I cry often, but That's, it's usually to worship, worship music. I think I cried probably on Sunday. Yes, sir. Um, to a song called Gyra by Maverick City. But it, then it's joy, rejoicing. It's, it's yeah, yeah, love of God. Yes, yeah. like it's I, a different on, cry. On, on my my birthday last year, November tenth, your boy turned thirty, and I went outside and I listened to the song called "You Made a Way." And I'm weeping mm. and I'm laughing and weeping down the streets of Beverly Hills because I'm like, you did it. And the, and the and it goes like, don't know how, but you did it. And I just start thinking about the imagery that will make me cry being in Philadelphia by myself. Mm-hmm. And I think about where I am now and I'm I'm crying and I'm laughing because I'm like, I made it because I, I weep for that person. Yeah. Cause I, oh, I was, oh, so sad. Just by yourself. Oh, it was just it was sad, man. It was sad. But that could happen again. You're going <laughs> to. No, it won't. What? Because you're in control of God isn't? <laughs> it, it won't happen again because I'd respond better. Okay. Okay. I wasn't. A, I wasn't wait, what, you, what you mean is not that you'll be dejected or rejected again, but, yeah. but the feeling that you had won't happen again if, if you lose yeah, your job. Or, is that yeah, what you mean? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I've, I've been, I've yeah. been low. I've been I've been low since. You're right. Like that's the thing people don't see. Like the conversation we're having now. My last thirteen months were great. Yo, I've been low. And nobody sees under the iceberg. I've been the lowest, y'all. But why, man? Life, dude. Tell me something specific. Why you been low? Give me the short version. The sh- you know, I don't like talking long. I speak in quotes, as y'all have read this by now. I don't like talking for you're, a long time. You're definitely, you've been trained. I like talking for a good time. <laughs> um, and I'm TV trained. I'm not radio trained. All good. Tell me why you're low. Um, or were. The reason I would be, probably relationally, like you, you, you get out of a relationship and you're just like, mm-hmm. you're... You're broken for a couple reasons, right? Like you're you're broken because you broke somebody else. You're broken because you've been broken. You're broken because you don't know if you'll ever be put together again. Mm. You know, you're just like, you're just broken. What do you, what are your relationships uh, or your friendships with women like? My I'm, I'm a I am a friendship for life person, and so my friendships with women, it's like if you ever did something for me, I'm with you for life. Which is un- it can be unfortunate because even like exes that have gone on to get married, like I'll be br- like my college ex. <clears throat> I'm sad that like we don't speak. She's married now, but I'm like, I'm indebted to you. Like you, what, you got what? Me th- what did she? What was it that she did for you? Got me through college, bruh. I mean, <laughs> whether it was, you know, <laughs> aiding with us homework, whether it was. Uh, uh, helping with laundry, whether it was just a a shoulder to talk to or cry on when you got hurt. It was like, no, I'm indebted to you Mm. Um, because I just feel like people contribute to other people. And if anybody's ever contributed to my life, I haven't forgotten you. Mm. And so my relationships, I probably prefer hanging out with women than men from a emotional component. Mm -hmm. You know, like, cause I'm so freaky. Cause men are robots? And yeah. women are easier to talk to. <laughs> I'm so I'm so one way. Give me the opposite. Like mm-hmm. give me somebody that can feel. Because I can't feel. I can think. Okay, so okay. So there we go. Now we're talking. Cause I have had the same problem my whole life. Don't you want to feel? Don't you want to be that safe place for other men? It's as though. I'm a safe place for other people, but I'm not a safe place for myself. Because uncomfortable conversation with a black man. Safe place. Yeah. Everybody come in. Um, you've seen the episode recently. Little Wayne calls me. I don't have, I don't have any relationship a, with Lil Wayne. It's a beautiful, beautiful at episode. All. And he calls me and he's like, hey, I want to tell this story that I've been essentially lying about for the last 26 years where I tried to kill myself. Huh? Why don't you try to kill you? And you calling me? You don't even know me. So clearly I've created this safe space for other people. But in my personal life, I don't do a good job of doing it. I don't really know that why. That is what we're talking about. That's, that's the heart. That's, that's the heart right there. That's because everything you said right there, that's the one that's going to stick. And that is such an important thing to look at and acknowledge, especially for our listeners. Okay, everybody hold that thought. Uh, we got to go pay some bills. We will be right back with Emmanuel Acho. This is Man Enough. Hey there. So I want to talk to you a little bit about planning, planning for the future, specifically a future that you are not here for. I can tell you as a parent 
for me, it was really important to buy life insurance, even though I don't like to think about that. Just knowing my family's gonna be taken care of just gives me peace of mind because no one knows what's gonna happen in life. And if you're thinking about that at all, please consider getting life insurance, specifically Ladder. Ladder is 100% digital, no doctors, no needles, no paperwork when you apply for $3 million in coverage or less. That means if something happens to you, your family gets $3 million. You just need a few minutes and a phone or a laptop to apply. And Ladder's smart algorithms work in real time, so you'll find out instantly if you're approved. And if you prefer, you can talk to a person. They have a team of licensed agents that don't work on commission, so they're not going to try to upsell you and have you spend more money. And there are no hidden fees, which means you can cancel at any time and get a full refund if you change your mind in 30 days or less. And ladder policies are issued by insurers with long proven histories of paying claims. They're rated A and A plus by AM Best. So you know if something happens to you, your family is going to get that money. And also, if you didn't already know this, something that I learned was that life insurance costs more as you age. Now is the time to cross it off your list. Don't wait. So go to ladderlife.com slash man enough to see if you're instantly approved. Again, that's L-A-D-D-E-R life.com slash man enough. All right, welcome back to the Man Enough podcast. Guys like you are who everybody wants to be. I mean, you're sitting next to me. Hell, I even want to be like you. <laughs> and And yet... I believe being like you comes at a cost. Absolutely. And and that if we're being honest, that's what that's what our society does. We create robots from mm -hmm. boys at a young age. And as Bell Hooks uh, says to quote a prolific black female author, we commit acts of soul murder where we sever the connection between our head and our hearts. We engage, as she says, in a psychic act of self-mutilation where we prevent ourselves from allowing ourselves to feel. And over time, we numb ourselves, not just to the world around us, but to our own feelings. And so my work, my personal work, is recognizing that the robotic part of me doesn't serve anybody in my life except me. And it only serves what the world congratulates and validates, which is work, profession, money doesn't serve my interpersonal relationships. It has not served my wife or my friendships and it's not serving my children. So the therapy I'm doing right now is about feeling. How can I feel? Why can't I feel? Being mad at myself, realizing like, oh my God, I've been so mean to me. I have been terrible to my body. I hate my body. My body failed me. And then I, well, well how does that feel? My therapist asked me. And I, I don't even have the words sometimes because nobody ever asked me that damn question as a man, how I feel. Right? So it's about reconnecting my head and my heart. And I just want to say that when you said, like, I don't know how to feel, to me, that's like, that is truth talking. So I wonder what Emmanuel Acho is like when he can reconnect with that feeling. Because you're already taking over the world. Now you can heal the world. I think the fear then for me is a matter of. You'd, I'd have to figure out how to turn it on and off. Like if I, if I started to, to, to let the rivers of feeling and emotion into my own life, I'd have to figure out how to turn it off when I'm in, in the business world. Welcome to being human, my brother. <laughs> and, and I think that's, that's a, yeah. that's a, I understand why you think that way. I think that's the wrong way to think. Yeah. I don't think you're, you're supposed to turn it off. We've been taught to turn it off because we see that as weakness. We see that, why would I turn off those things that you just mentioned? Mm -hmm. If in fact I see those things as valuable, I'm gonna go into every meeting with those things turned on. I'm gonna do everything I'm gonna do. I'm gonna play sports with them. I'm gonna talk to my children that way. I'm gonna talk to, the, you know, I'm gonna do my stuff. But we see those things as weak. So we've been taught we, to see those things as weak. That's what I'm saying, right. Yeah. So, um, so I just think, I understand why you think that way because I think a lot of men are brought up that way. But I think it's we need to reevaluate that. I'm sorry, Liz. I think I cut well, you off. There. I also, if you think you can control your emotions, your emotions are always going to control you. Like your emotions are there, <laughs> and emotions are messages. So you either are listening, and again, if I'm listening to the fact that I'm sad, it doesn't mean that I have to like cry here in front of all of you. It means I can manage it and take that message and say, okay, something's going on. 
I'm in a meeting right now. I'm going to deal with this afterwards. And I think when we tell men, you just don't have those or you can shut them off. It is an illusion of control, which actually leads to you not being in control at all. Okay. As I look at it, it's almost like emotions and the armor, if you will, or emotions and the logic, if you will, they both fully activate. But I will never let the emotion make the final decision. When it comes time, Liz, for me to make a final decision, emotion will never make it. But emotion is, I mean, there's so much data, right? I mean, like Malcolm Gladwell writes about this. Of, of it just Phenomenal lists, author. Yeah, lists that you know the right decision based on your emotion. Like your gut is your emotion. That has like, it's, it's the center of decision making in our bodies. So if you're cut off from that and you're all up here, the decisions that you're making are not necessarily the right decisions. And uh, the way to be disconnected, I do that all the time, by the way. And I'm a woman. I grew up with like Barbie dolls and all that <laughs> shit. Like, and I do that where I intellectualize. I use data. I use like all these, sto the storytelling and all of the, you know, the research to create an avoidance, to, to really avoid the emotion. So intellectualizing events is a way to cut yourself off from the feelings of the events. I want to second that in that we're all here. We're all smart. We're all pretty smart. And I can rationalize my way out of anything. And when I started therapy, I went through therapists because I would sit in front of therapists and think that I was smarter than them. And they'd ask me questions. And if I can get out of the question, that's not my therapist. It wasn't until I found a therapist who told me to stop trying to be my therapist, <laughs> to stop trying to rationalize. And he says, no, no, Justin, I asked you how you feel about that. I didn't ask you what you think about how you feel about that. And that's the difference. And I speak as a person who's on that journey. You wanna talk about journey to recovery. That's the journey I'm on, which is, it's not how I think I feel, it's how do I feel. And half the time I have zero vocabulary for how I actually feel in my body, which is why as a leader, as a successful man, especially as a successful white man, I have to be ripping this armor off because in every room I'm in, I, ha I have to have empathy and compassion and sensitivity. Otherwise, I am so disconnected, not just from myself and my feelings, but from everybody who works for me and who I employ to our listeners, right? And that's why I just think that it's important for us to recognize that sensitivity emotions they don't make us weak the difference is and where i agree with you is that we can't let them lead that you don't you don't just let your emotions lead the way and make emotional decisions because there's truth in that mm -hmm. one of my one of my mentors who passed away um marvin brock our mutual friend who i brought up he was a martial arts master he taught me how to meditate he's the one that taught me and i was going through this bad situation with my wife she was my girlfriend then and she was it wasn't gonna, it wasn't looking good and i called him and he said what are your, right now, what are your emotions telling you to do? And I told him, and he said, do the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> because it was coming from a place of fear. It wasn't coming from love. It was coming from a lack of, it was coming from my desperation to hold her, to keep her, to, to be who she wanted me to be, to, be, to win that fight. Versus what's the best thing for her? What's the best thing for me? I wasn't thinking soberly. I, I, I'll say this because I'm, I'm not a proponent of I'm not the type who thinks emotions make somebody weak. Right. Like I'm in the end. You don't I'm strike me as anti no, no. that. Yeah. Like just for, for the clarity of the listener. Like I, it's almost like I calculate my emotions even mm -hmm. like I know when I'm going to be emotional. Right. Like on but that can't make you happy. I well, yeah. it, I, there's there's that's a question and I'll get to that. I'm like, even on, on Saturday, I was like, you know what? Tomorrow morning, Sunday morning, it's past, past Saturday. And I was like, Sunday morning, it's going to be like a good just cry morning. <laughs> you know, like okay. just a good like. I'm not mad like, at that. Like, I'm just going to sit there, talk to God and just, you know what I mean? Like, I'm just calculating it because I'm like, I ain't got time to just sit here and let my emotions just run rush out all over my life. Um, so I'm a huge proponent of it. I just I just am tactical even with how I utilize my emotions. Mm. Now, you asked a question. Um, it can't make you happy. I, I again, it comes down to my training. I I remember this because people people ask me. They were like, "Oh, you know, the Emmys are coming up September twelfth, September nineteenth." They're like, "Oh, I'm sure that'll be fun." And I simply respond, "The fun is in winning. The fun is in winning. 
Um, my coach told me that when I was in college and it stuck with me. So you say it doesn't make you happy. I'm always joyful. The happiness is a winning. That's that's my mind. Like that's like I'm always joyful, right? Mm. I'm all because I think joy but doesn't is. Hap- but doesn't happiness internal. come from what you have, not from what you're seeking? Happiness for me, it comes in the doing. It comes in the accomplishing. Whether it's relationally, whether it's making somebody happy, whether it's. Um, but that's not winning. That's the doing. But if you do, it's weird because I'm like, if you do, mm-hmm. you gotta win. There is, there's, there's no other option. But there's, but only look. I, I made a movie this year, Clouds on Disney, and we did a whole Emmys push. And I didn't get nominated. If I, if my not nomination dictated my happiness, I'd be a miserable person. I didn't make that movie to be nominated. So, I made that movie to touch people's hearts. So the, ha- if the happiness is in the doing, which is what you just said, mm-hmm. then it isn't in the winning. But I'm, for me, it's implied that you will win. You had like it's just, but like, if, but if you feel- lost, would you still have won? Man, I, yeah. Would it, you have still been happy if you lost, or would you have been like, now we got to go back and win next year? You got to win. Mm-hmm. But that's that's where I think this conversation. That's where we're, we're that's where we're at the impasse. Yeah, because I'm like, no. What, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man, I didn't correct you. It wasn't number one on the New York Times bestsellers list. It was number three. The, Uncomfortable the Conversations with was, a Black Boy was number one. Was number one on the New York Times bestsellers list. I know it was number three because I didn't win. Yeah. McConaughey was number one. And <laughs> Humans of New York was number two. Yeah. I know I got number three. So when we And your next book's going to be number one, isn't it? <laughs> you know? Um, so <laughs> hey, that's, that's, good. that's where I'm at, like. Uh, does it make you happy? I don't. I don't. I don't like. I don't know. That's that's the wrestling, the introspective mm. journey that I haven't fully taken. Yeah, I feel you. That's the introspective journey that I just haven't gone on. Yeah. It's like I don't know mm-hmm. if it makes me happy. But that's a great place to be for you to admit that. Mm-hmm. To admit you don't know something is huge. That we don't know is wonderful. So amen to that. Yes, sir. Because I know I know this. I know that I don't always do what I want to do. I know that much. Even in life now, like I don't get to do what I want to do. Yeah. I don't get to always do the things that would make me the happiest because it doesn't follow my logical plan. And that's mm. what I've really been wrestling with the most probably the last like six months. I have a logical plan and I know where my logical plan will take me. But what I want to do doesn't always coincide. So that's interesting. So it's kind of like your diagram of emotions Correct. Uh, and, and logic. Your logical plan is, is not congruent with your N- happiness plan. Yes. And I'm like, let me follow my logical plan because the other one is scary. This is what I hope for you because you are powerful, brother. Mm-hmm. And you have an opportunity to move and touch a lot of hearts. I'm sure you, you are, in fact, doing that. In 20 years from now, when you're my age, you will, um, a lot's going to change in your life over the next 20 years, right? Because we spend the first 25 years of our life kind of like developing who we are, right? Uh, we go to school, we go to college, all this stuff. We're like, we're, we're gathering information. And the next 25, 30 years of our life is now we start, you know, putting those into application and building our home. Right. The first part, we're like getting all the ingredients to build our home. Now we're building our home in this phase, the phase you're in. Then you get to be about, I don't know, 60 and the rest of the time is now you're kind of living in the home that you built and then you get to reflect. So you are in this building stage and you're going to get to a time where I'm at when you're preparing to now live in all that. You're going to have kids. They're going to be making choices. They're going to come to you and they're going to be like, uh, hey, I'm going down this path and you're going to give them advice. Because you would have learned, oh, when I did this, I, I could have done it this way. Yeah. Um, they're going to be in a relationship with a woman and make some choices that maybe you see as, you know, uh, try it this way. Because you would have reflected in your own marriage or your relationship. Um, so what I hope, because there's a lot of men out there, wonderful, beautiful men who don't think they need any fixing. We all need fixing. Um, and it's all good. 
you too are going to need some fixing. Um, so I hope over the next 20 years, 30 years, that you become comfortable with also being um, not all together. That you're comfortable and give other men permission to be broken and yet still be powerful. Mm -hmm. So that when you do your stuff from now on, you can say to men, oh, you've done that. Oh, OK, it's all good. God loves you. I got you. We can work that out. You're not evil or bad or this or you're not weak. You just got some things we need to adjust. And if we adjust those things, the world will be better for women and for white people and for Latinos and for the world. So um, I'm not saying you're not doing that now. Take what I said and throw out all the garbage and then maybe hold on to one or two things that may have some impact. Because uh, I really think you have an opportunity to do a lot of amazing things in this world. But we can't do it as men, as black men, unless we acknowledge that we are human and flawed. Um, otherwise, we keep our armor on. But I appreciate you, man. I really do, because you are you are speaking a lot of knowledge and a lot of great things, and this is what we need on this podcast. You know, this voice. I appreciate that. I um, this was interesting. How are you feeling? I was going to actually ask you. This was interesting. How, how are you feeling right now? Um, I'm feeling questioned, challenged, mm. challenging myself. Love that. Um, are you comfortable with that? Yeah, but I'm comfortable with. For the most part, anything. Good. Um, most people, I haven't been challenged like this in, yeah, um, I don't know, maybe a couple of years. Most people don't challenge me anymore. Mm. Um, but you're a, you're, you're a football player, so you'd like to challenge. Yeah. Most people don't challenge me intellectually. You, people challenge me physically, but most people don't challenge <laughs> me intellectually. <laughs> Um, so I haven't been cha I haven't been challenged like this intellectually. I, I'd argue it's not intellectual. I'd argue it's emotional, mm -hmm. which is why it's a challenge. There, which is what Liz does for us all the time. <laughs> and I also haven't made myself available to mm -hmm. you know what I mean. Like, I, I wouldn't willingly. Mm -hmm. I haven't made myself willingly. I rarely make myself willingly available. Do um, you feel? Do you feel? Um, while you said you're feeling challenged. Do you feel like we've been respectful in the challenging? Oh, of course, of okay, course, good. of course. I think everything has been respectful. This is one of those, I'll leave this conversation and think. Hmm. Like on the drive home, like I'll re-ask myself the questions that you all asked me. <laughs> um, well, if you re-ask yourself the questions and you feel like you have different answers and you want to come back, yeah. anytime. <laughs> yes, we're all here. Anyway. Honestly, <laughs> I, feel, um, I feel like y'all are disappointed. No, in what? What? I, I say this because... I am. I love that you said that, though. I, I genuinely, I, I, well, one, I read body language and I read questions and I'm, I listen to everything that everybody says at every time as it's said. Good. And I've watched everything that everybody's done since I sat down from facial reactions to Liz while I'm talking to you to turning to make sure I look at you to involve you in the conversation because you're sitting here by yourself. I mean, everything <laughs> I do is it's overly thought out and overly calculated. I feel you. And so. I, I just, I feel like I wasn't this like open book, open box, mm -mm. but I'm like, honestly, I was just me. That's why when, when I was no. answering the questions, yes, I was just like, no, but you were, you told the truth. You told the yeah, truth. Let me, well, yeah. let me dispel that for you because none of us are disappointed uh -uh. at I'm, all. In, in fact, fact let me, let this me tell is you, why we do this, this show. This is why we do it. I'm, I'm not, not only am I, am I not disappointed, I'm proud of you. You know why? Because you feel like you weren't enough for us or something. Correct. Okay, and yet you are here. You you are staying and having a conversation, even though in the moment you're like, oh, I'm being challenged. I don't know if I'm feel, if, if they think I'm enough because that couldn't be further than the truth. Because the truth is all, everyone that's enlightened in the world and like having conversations and all stuff, okay, cool. I'm more interested in those of us that are like, you know, on our process and in our journey mm -hmm. and who are willing to stick in a room to have a conversation that might be uncomfortable. I, it's, it's weird because honestly, I've done, I've probably done, man, this is probably now we're getting real. <laughs> I, I, I've probably done, I don't know, maybe 200 interview conversation podcasts last year. And I always, I put on a show. People pay me to put on a show or mm. don't pay me to put on a See, show. We didn't want your show. But in this conversation, I feel like y'all were expecting like, you know, the to come in with all this armor and it be released and done. No, nope. but I'm like, honestly, that's why I don't feel like we didn't know you had any armor. That's why I don't feel like. I don't feel like the the product was great. 
Are you kidding? Are you kidding? This is probably See, one of my you know favorites. What? Here's what's so funny. I, I, you if you and that. I spent some time together, we have so much in common. I do the same thing when I'm talking to every, people. Every episode, man, we leave. Not everyone. Forgive me. I'm going to call you straight out. We do it. And Justin's like, oh, did I do enough? Did I say the right? Was it? And yet, in the meantime, he's moved a thousand hearts. He's done all this great work. Wow, he didn't feel enough. So you right now have moved a lot of hearts. That's the point. That, there, there's, so that's, no, there's no outcome. Uh -uh. When we're doing this, this is a conversation. We want to have men on this show that represent men from all walks of life. Yeah, we this is not some like, hey, let's get all the wokest people on the show to talk about our feelings and cry and kumbaya together. That's not what this is. We want to have conversations with men where they're at. And if and honestly, all this was was we didn't none of us knew a conversation. We had all these questions about your book and all your show and all this stuff you're doing. And, and you took us in another direction. Mm -hmm. And that's what this is. This is better than we ever could have imagined. Yeah, real stuff. Real and uh, and what I appreciate is you hosting uncomfortable conversations and being willing to have one. Well, shit, that's to My me, man. that's man enough. And that's bravery. And you didn't have courage to. And, and strength. And again, when you, when you leave this conversation and you think about it mm -hmm. and you want to come back and talk more, <laughs> come on back. I appreciate it. No, so, I, I think that's, but I think that's what it's about. It's if you can get to the uncomfortable, I think that's where you grow. Mm -hmm. You know, and it might not be today. It might not be tomorrow. But I genuinely think like reflecting on these questions, yeah. like that's what will lead to growth yeah. in whatever areas growth is necessary. Because what you did is you showed your vulnerability in that. When you just said, I feel like I disappointed y'all, you showed vulnerability right there. It's something that oftentimes us men don't want to show. It was just real. I'm on. I, I'm honest. I love it. You know, my therapist often tells me. Wow, your posture changed. Your voice changed. You took your armor off. And you are different than when you sat down. You're you're different. You're more present. You're focused. You're you're leading. You're like you're here. You're, you're still, truly you're still here. Great. You're still amazing. But what I'm saying is that, oh, that's the guy I want to go hang out with. I'm I'm gonna text you. You probably never want to talk to me again. But I'm gonna text you, uh, and we can have a whole other conversation about this I afterwards. Love I love it. But but I really appreciate you showing up because that's what we gotta do as men. We gotta show up and push through all of this stuff. So rapid fire questions. Yes. Rapid. This means we we gonna go rapid. Just sure. quick answers, quick okay. questions. Welcome to this week's Man Enough Podcast Rapid Fire Questions. You have a time travel device. You get to go back to seven eight, nine-year-old Emmanuel. What do you want to say to him? I would say, don't worry, it'll all work out. Because if I could just hear that constantly, man, I would be so reassuring. Love don't that. worry, it'll all work out. And then if you skipped forward and you went to Philadelphia, what do you say to that, Emmanuel? Keep your head up. Hmm. I'll just say keep your head like. Just keep your head up, man. Like, you'll get through it. You'll get through it. Keep your head up. And then you fast forward to the end of your life. You're a ghost at your own funeral. What do you hope that people say about you and the way you move through the world as a man? Man, I've always said I want to be thought of as a noble man of prominent character. Mm. A noble man of prominent character. So I, I, I really just want to hear, like, well done. You know, All like right. well, well done. Like but I just, I just want to be thought of as like a noble, just a noble man, just like a good man yeah. who cared, yeah. who died for people, who sacrificed for people, who loved people. But just like a, just a, a noble, just a good man. Mm. Mm. That's good. Um, are you glad you came on our podcast? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, one, Justin's my dog, you know, that's, that's my guy, um, my social media friend, but now <laughs> real life friend. I feel weird right now. And so I got to go back and process why I feel like this. I don't, I, I put on a show. That's what I do mm. for the last 13 months. I put on a show and I didn't put on a show. Mm. And so I don't like, I feel like I let, feel a little naked. I feel like a di I feel disappointed in me. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. like I I just I got to go process this feeling. What's the show that you think you should have put on? 
when people turn on whatever they turn on to see me, mm. it's to it's to it's to put on a show. And I just I don't feel enough. Like I just I just I I don't I don't like the feeling. That's probably I, why so many men stay away from feeling because then we don't feel enough and we're not uncomfortable with that. We don't know what to do with that. I don't like it. Yeah, I, like, I like I like rocking with confidence. See, also, when I walked in here, I'm like, I'm, I like I like walking with confidence, but I'm just like. You're still being confident, bro. Yeah, this Something... is more, to me, this is more confident than how you came in. You feel more not confident. Not that how you came in was wrong. Just, you feel real. Just, just, this just take that yeah. in for a second. Hold on. Listen to what the woman said. <laughs> <laughs> That's always wise. You feel way more confident than the guy that walked in. I Because you're here. I feel like doubtful. Mm. I, I, I feel doubtful. That's what we do. I feel like, I feel unsure. Welcome to being human. Welcome to dude. being human, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and feeling it all and taking the armor off. And then you get to demonstrate, even though I felt that, I'm still me. I'm still confident. I'm still brave. I'm still putting on a show in my life. I still got this, and I felt that too. I just I don't feel as like capable of dominating. Great, because domination is a symptom of the patriarchy, man. Domination is what we're taught we have to be. When in reality, you are a Christian. You believe in Jesus. There's nothing in the Bible that says that you, as a follower of Jesus, need to be dominating. Jesus said the meek will inherit the earth. Mm -hmm, that's true. Humility. You cannot be dominant of everything and be humble. It's the person good. you want to be at the end of your life who you just said is not a domination wasn't in that. <laughs> it's real. And yet um your confidence in how you walk is beautiful and I love it. You know what's so great is this person here, I really want to like I want to be friends with you. <laughs> yes sir. The person that walked in I would want to hang out with, but I could never I could never tell you some shit that was happening in my life because I don't know if you could have held it. Mm -hmm. This guy, you can hold it. And that's the difference. Like we talk about creating safe spaces for men. These are the conversations that have to happen. Because mm -hmm. as a man, I gotta see that you're not just gonna dominate me and walk all over me. That, you're, that you can also hold some of my pain. That there's place for me to be human. And if anything, maybe you're just leaving here feeling a little bit more human and hmm. it's not always it's not it's not always I the most it. safe somebody give me my place. robot back <laughs> <laughs> yes sir all right final question final question liz you want to ask it? what does it mean to you now after this conversation uh to be man enough to be man enough is to embrace the fact that not being enough is a part of being enough. Mm. You know, I think being man enough mm. is to em embrace that. Say that, say it again. Yeah. Not being, what? not being enough is being enough. My man. I wow. Mean, that's, that's a shirt right there. That's the, that's the takeaway. Love it. I still don't know how I feel. That's all right. Good. But yeah. in the meantime, that's the takeaway. My man. <laughs> that's only because you haven't been trained <laughs> to, to feel. feel. Exactly right. Let me just tell you, my brother, you are man enough. My man. Thank you for being here, yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, you so for having much, uncomfortable brother. conversations with us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I believe your robot is being flown back in. <laughs> uh, we'll be right back. Uh, this is Man Enough. Hello, and welcome back to Man Enough. Whew. Man, that was good. How are you guys feeling? How are you guys feeling? I felt him at the end. Mm -hmm. I really, you know what? That's what it is. When he came in, larger than life, beautiful. Wonderful. This, this, he, he's brilliant. So damn smart. Um, and I had admiration and respect for him. But by the end of the conversation, I felt him. Mm -hmm. That's what it was for me, is I could feel him. I could feel his heart. And uh, and I couldn't feel his heart at the at the start. He said when he said, "Not being enough is being enough, or not feeling enough is being enough." Mm -hmm. um, that's the one that I feel like 
brought it all to a close, you know, like he acknowledged, okay, he was feeling, I love that part, his vulnerability. And then he was willing to finally uh, get there with us. And, the, and, the, and what's so funny is I'm replaying the conversation in my head and we all had a very different conversation in mind going into the show. Mm -hmm. Like the, mm -hmm. we had all these questions that we didn't get to ask. And I love how it kind of organically unfolded. Mm -hmm. How about, how about you? How'd you feel? Uh, I thought, yeah, your comment about your therapist. I thought my therapist says that to me too. <laughs> She's like, Oh look, <laughs> cause I come in like, Ugh, and I don't even know I'm, Ugh, you know? And I think, you were able to point out something that he doesn't even really think about maybe that this armor is on a lot. Um, I didn't really get answers to some of my questions. So I'm hoping that he comes back so that we can go even deeper. And you, you know what? Um, I often think about this um, in my life dealing with race. I don't expect people um, to be different overnight. I don't expect someone who's a good white person, but has blind spots that when we have one conversation, I don't expect them to all of a sudden get it. Otherwise, I will constantly be disappointed. Mm -hmm. So rather, I've experienced that a lot of things are slow burns. Like you have a conversation, someone reflects, you have another conversation, there's more reflection. Um, I would mm -hmm. say for a lot of men that are listening, that are wonderful, beautiful men and confident and, um, and might see themselves in him oh, so, because he's wonderful, Yeah. who um, aren't, don't feel comfortable being naked with the armor off. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where you're at today. Mm -hmm. I don't expect you to have all the answers to Liz's questions tomorrow, or maybe mine or whoever's. So, um, but as long as you're willing to have a conversation about it, then maybe in a year from now, and a few more times of those, you know, those questions being asked, you might have an answer that's satisfactory to a woman, mm -hmm. where you couldn't in the beginning. Mm. Right. But I think those questions can go hand in hand, right? Like, I think that we've had conversations around masculinity that connected to women, and we didn't really connect a lot to women. Or when I brought it up, it, we didn't really go there. And I hear that, and I mm -hmm. agree with you, 100% agree with you. Um, because we can't deal with all things at the same time, right? So mm -hmm. maybe it was just first having the discussion about armor. Yeah. And just being willing to yeah. say, like, there's such and such, so that then, a follow-up conversation or a third or fourth is someone like to like relate. Yeah. It's kind of like it's therapy. Like you therapy. go into therapy expecting to have one conversation and then you have another. Right. And I right. think it's beautiful that it was happening amongst you. Mm -hmm. And I think this is like where I would love for all three of you to do this again and go to brunch <laughs> and then bring him to the, right, like and bring each other mm -hmm. forward. Yeah. And I appreciate And that, that would be, that's what I want to see more of. I think that was really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Like he really came through <laughs> and came out of his shell in a way that I like after the third time we were like we were like you know your armor like and he was kind of like dismissive I was like oh this is not gonna happen but it did like he really like the real him came through by the end of it and that was and really that beautiful. to me was his courage and strength yeah. and all of that stuff that he was that he comes with yeah his show that he kept talking about yes. which is wonderful his show is great oh my gosh yes um but when he started doing that, like you said, that was mm. that was even. Oh my God! Of course, I was more confident. Right. Yeah, I, I just wish men, all men, could realize that when they when they show when 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 they take that armor off, when they show who they really are, when they expose their hearts, when they get vulnerable. There's nothing stronger. Mm -hmm. There's nothing. Yeah. There's nothing that's more courageous. And he said yeah. the word courageous. And and it takes true courage to stay in the room in that conversation. It does. I agree. And, and tell the truth. And, and he yeah. and what I what I love, he so could have deflected a lot of those questions. But when he said, you know, I'm not feeling enough. I'm not feeling like I let you guys down. That is so freaking courageous. I love that. That was so brave of him to say. Because he, we can't expect someone to have arrived to where we want them. All I care about is, are you willing to go on a journey with me for a minute? And when he said that, that was him uh, acknowledging that. And honestly, what I care about is that he was even here. Yeah. That he showed up. And I appreciate you, Liz, because what you said, you asked questions, of course, but you recognize, I could see you recognizing, oh, this is, there are times as I use that example about the orchestra and stuff, and sometimes we need to be together so we can work out our stuff. 
it's almost like you said, okay, right now they're working on their horns a little bit. I appreciate that you allowed us to tune yeah. our tune our instruments together. Yeah. It's beautiful to watch. In that in that process in real time, mm-hmm. just like go through it. And if you're still listening to this, thank you for uh, listening to us and learning in real time. And uh, we're all at different stages of learning. Uh, None of us here at this table have it all figured out. We are all just trying every day to be better. And these are the conversations that we believe Mm -hmm. can lead to our collective freedom. I have a question for you. Will you ever get better at being at the middle of the table or will you always be like, I mean, just in terms of... I just gravitate more towards my feminine side. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but I thought feminine, femininity doesn't have anything to do with being a woman. So mm-hmm. I'm gravitating. Listen, that was my, that was my response to your stupid question. <laughs> <laughs> fair uh, enough. Fair enough. Thank you so much for listening to Man Enough. If you like what you hear, please like and subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You go to manenough.com/podcast. And until next time, I am Justin Baldoni. I'm Liz Plank. And I'm Jamie Heath. And this is Man Enough. <laughs> <laughs>